Um, Ian once said to me, we don't want to preach word, words that challenge us. We want to preach words that change us. And um, I pray that the word will change you and that the word is changing you, not just challenging you. We can all be challenged and ignore it. Yeah. Oh, that was really challenging. Don't leave this place saying, oh, that was really challenging because you will just not do anything with it. Say um, that word, what God has said to me today is change something in me and then go put it into practice. So the word of God shouldn't just challenge us. It should change us. So verse 31, here we go. So Jehoshaphat was king over Judah, and he was 35 years old when he became king, and he reigned 25 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Azuba, king, um, the daughter of Shilhai, and he walked in the way of his father Asa and did not turn aside from it, doing what was right in the sight of the Lord. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away. For as yet, the people had not directed their hearts to the God of their fathers. Okay, so Jehoshaphat is known for walking the way of his father, the king before, Asa, who honored God. Okay, so, and it's, they did right what was in, 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 in the sight of the Lord. So they did the right things. They were known for doing what was right before God. So then, how is it possible that even though he was king and he did what was right that the people still worshipped false gods high places as it is mentioned here it states that Jehoshaphat and his father Asa kept their eyes on God and it's known that this is what they're known as but they both failed to remove the high place it was one of the major things that I failed to close down the high places So we can be successful in our walk with God. Yeah, we can, we can walk it out with Jesus and we can actually see God do things in our life. Yeah? We can see miracles happen around us. We could be used to lead people to Jesus. And yet, if we don't deal with the high places that are in our lives, we are limited in what we are before God. You see, his reputation is he's known as someone that did right in the sight of God. That's brilliant, isn't it? What a, what a reputation to have. But didn't deal with the high places. His father and him. We've got to close down the high places. We've got to close down the things in our lives that have elevated themselves above God. Because this is how the enemy will work. He will deceive you into thinking you're doing okay with the Lord because the Lord is still going to bless you. Why is he going to bless you? Because he's a good father. He's, he's protecting you. He's doing so much to keep you out of trouble that you can see that as just being the blessing of your works. But actually, it's just the blessing of the father. And if we are not actually attending to what God wants to do in our lives, and he's, when he's pointing to these high places, and these aren't high, this is what the Lord said to tell you today. These aren't high places you don't know. You know they exist. You're turning a blind eye to them because, one, you don't want to deal with it, or two, you like it. And God is highlighting these things in our lives. He's saying there are high places in your life. There are things that go above me. There are things that, that take your mind and control of your mind, take control of your lifestyle, take control of, of what your thoughts and what's going on, and they consume you, and I don't have any space. There's no room for me. So whilst you might have a blessed life in Jesus, because you can have a blessed life in Jesus, because the Holy Spirit has moved into your life, is way better than when you didn't have the Holy Spirit, is it not? Yeah? So we're blessed. We are blessed people. But that doesn't mean that there aren't things in our life that we're, we, are not, we are meant to be attending to, that we're ignoring. There are high places. What can this look like for us as a church? Well, as a church, we can see salvations and baptisms. But if we don't address things like gossip, agendas, slander, 
if we fail to love one another as Jesus loves us, God said, and this is what he said to me, we can become a house of hypocrites. And what do we want to become known as? Do we want to be known that this house, this body, is known as God's house? As for me and my house, we serve the Lord and we are known? Or do we want to become known as a house of hypocrites? This isn't a, a thing that, that is, to me is happening or anything like that. It's just God is warning. He is saying, if we don't actually deal with the high places in our lives, this is what we can become. So we can see all the blessings. We can see people giving their lives to Jesus. We can see miracles happening. We can see growth and people being discipled and lives being changed. And yet God is saying, That's, you're, you are known as people that followed me, but didn't deal with the high places. And we've got to deal with the high places. We've got to make sure that these things are torn down when they start to rise up. What about our personal lives? We can be walking with God and the enemy can still have high places over your life. We can know the victory of Jesus. We can know the work of the cross and what it's done for us. We can see God moving in our lives, but still struggle. Still not see the full victory of what Jesus has done for us. And that's because we failed to close down the high places. Now, these high places can be addictions. They can be unforgiveness. They can be hate, unhealed wounds, like I spoke about a few weeks ago. Rejection that has been suffered. Anger not dealt with, insecurities not overcome, fears not defeated. It could be a person who has hurt you or has done wrong to you in some way. And you can't seem to escape from that. High places are often things we are aware of. They're not things that God needs to reveal to us. They're there that we're aware of. We're just being ignorant or trying to be ignorant of their existence and pretend they're not there when really we do know they're there. And God is saying, you're not dealing with this. Do not be a Christian who is known for making that step, but where people will say, man, they were incredible in the way they honor God, but they never really fulfilled what God had for them because there were certain things in their life they wouldn't attend to with the Lord. I urge you, church, to avoid allowing high places to dominate your story, tear them down, and bring them down in Jesus' name. So we're going to do that just right now. You already know what the high place is in your life. This is what the Lord is saying. You already know what these things are. So we're going to turn to the person next to you. Okay? You ready? Today, I declare that I will acknowledge the high place that is in my life right now. And I will make steps to see it torn down. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now turn to the other person on the other side. Today, I declare that I will acknowledge the high place that's in my life right now. And I will make steps to see it torn down. In Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 34. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat, first and last, indeed, they are written in the book of Jehu, the son of Hanani, who is mentioned in the book of the kings of Israel. Verse 35. After this, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, allied himself with Isaiah, king of Israel, um, who acted wickedly. And he allied himself with him to make the ships go to Tarshish. Now they were going there. It says in, in Kings 1 Kings 21. Um, 
that they were going there for gold. Okay. And they made ships of Ezion, Geba, and Eliza, but Eliza, the son of Dodava, of Merisha, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, because you have allied yourself with Isaiah, the Lord has destroyed your works. Then the ships were wrecked so that they were not able to go to Tarshish. Now, it is believed um, through study, through, through um, scholars, people that have put effort in to, to search, search this out, that King Jehoshaphat, um, who is like a f- following on as a king from King Solomon, and King Solomon in all of his splendor, he's known as the, the one that built the temple and there was gold and riches and everything, that there's a belief that the reason he aligns himself with the king of Israel who's wicked is because he's trying to emulate a previous king and he's trying to gain gold from Tarshish to ensure that his reputation is looking like that of Solomon's. Today's message title is God broke it, don't fix it. Turn to the person next to you say God broke it, don't fix it. Say it to them again. God broke it. Don't fix it. Yeah. (laughs) Don't fix it. (laughs) So Jehoshaphat is, is trying to emulate, he's trying to match something that's happened before a previous king did. The Lord wants you to know today, comparison will kill you. Comparison will kill you. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to be somebody you're not by trying to copy somebody God has not called you to be. So what we do is what we do as people is we we walk with God and, and what happens is then we look around and we maybe have certain things that go in on our hearts that God is laying in there. And then we start looking at how other people do whatever maybe God is starting to stir. And what can happen, which happens a lot of times, because I believe God calls everybody to do something, is that people look at what somebody's doing that kind of connects with what God has started to do in the heart. And they see somebody who's not the finished product, but somebody that's a bit further down the road. And they say, I could never do that. And they quit. What they don't know is that that person went on a journey exactly the same as they did to say, okay, I don't know what I'm doing, but let's start the journey. And they ended up getting to that place. But comparison will kill you. Comparison will kill the dream that God is putting in your heart. Because when God says you can do this, you can do all things through Christ that strengthens you. Yeah, When he says these things to you, what you say is, yeah, but I can't be that person. And God said... I'm not calling you to be that person. I'm calling you to be the person I've called you to be. So comparison will kill you. And and so, and and what does it, what does it lead to? Look at what goes on here with Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat wants to emulate a great king. So, so he can't do that himself. So what does he do? Okay, well, how am I going to get the reputation that makes me look like somebody in the past that will give me the status in history that says I was a great king, just like he was. The only way I can become that is if I align myself with wickedness. And a lot of us, a lot of us, what we choose to do is we choose to go down a path that gets us to a destination we believe we need, we believe is where we want to get to, we've constructed as a, a, a form in our mind, it was like, that's going to give me the status, the reputation, the comfort, the love. That's going to give me the fix that I need. That's the destination. That's where I want to get to. So if it's not God's path, we're not going to get there with God. We're not going to have the... I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because he ain't going to strengthen you for that journey. So what do we do? We have to go on a a, a self-seeking plan 
to get to the destination that fulfills whatever it is that we feel that we need to be fulfilled by. And we have to align ourselves with wickedness to get there. We have to cross, cut corners and cross lines that are not of God to be able to be fulfilled in the thing that isn't what God wants for us, but it's what we're being drawn to because it pleases us or because we feel that's what we need to make us somebody. The only, the only one who you need to make sure that you're right before is God. One of the greatest fears in this world but actually, probably the greatest fear in the church, in Christianity, is fear of man. Fear about what they think. Worried about how they see you. And that fear drives us to do things God doesn't want us to do. To make alliances with things that are not of God but will lead us down a path where we might get that fulfillment which we are seeking, but is not part of God's plan. This is a warning from God to say, your path is not his path. And you need to get off that path today. Because it will lead you into wicked things that will cause you pain and consequence. God's plan, a man, I hate this word, but I've started to love it. Now I'm chilling. Now I've realized I, I can't, but this word, I used to hate it when people used to say it to me when I was younger. God's plan will require patience. You right there, Joab? Yeah, flashbacks. <laughs> when, you're, when you're younger, even when you're older, because I still get, I still get, all ages come up to me and say, we got to do something quicker. I'm like, patience now, I'm, I'm chilling. I'm like, I feel like I'm retired in a retirement home now. Patience. God will do it or God won't do it. God will provide or he won't provide. Who are you, who are you relying on? God, God will make a way or he won't make a way. And what we're doing is we're saying, I'm not sure it's happening the way I want it to happen. It's not coming in the timing I want. So I'm going to make an uh, alliance with wickedness because I can't trust God to do it quickly enough. In the way I want. And this is how we make bad decisions. So King Jehoshaphat allies with the wicked king of Israel. And they look to build a fleet of ships. Got wind going on. It's like, okay, Lord, is this the right word? I just need to lightning, stay away. But God. Turn to the person next to you say, but God. Oh, I love that one. <laughs> this, is, this is such an incredible message. If you read this you're, and you get it, you're just going to realize how much God loves you. How much God loves you. But God destroyed those works and wrecked the ships so they couldn't fulfill the plan. God is saying to you today, he's had to break some things in your life in order for you to live. What you saw as a defeat when he broke you or broke what you were putting your hand to was actually the grace of God. God broke it to save you, to ensure that you live free. Don't fix it. Leave it. <laughs> you know, there's, um, Jess did a message. I'm going to literally do the opposite of your message, but your message was great. Okay, so Jess, is, there's a, there's, 
So God puts together broken pieces, doesn't he? Yeah, are we all broken pieces that God has put together? Yeah, amen. This is not that message. Okay, all right, so, so that is, that's truth. God puts us together, okay? He puts things together that are broken. We are, we're all testament to that. But when things, especially when we're followers of God, when things don't go the way we want them to, oh man, we curse Satan. Oh, Satan, get behind me, Satan. We're cussing other people. We're like, oh, it's their fault. I wouldn't be in this situation if it wasn't for them. Ah. Oh. And God said, I, I did it. I did it. I broke that. Satan didn't do it. Satan didn't do it. One of the things he breaks in all of us is pride. You're sat there going, I, I had a plan. And now I'm in the gutter. And God said, good. Now you're in the gutter, you might actually start looking up. Amen. Yeah? I had to break you first. You ha- you, we think Satan. We think the enemy. We think others. Yeah, sometimes that's the story. A, those stories exist. The enemy does do those things. People do do those things. But this isn't that message. This is a message for you to understand that sometimes the breaking in you is coming from God because you're not listening. And because you are doing things that are going to lead you to a path of destruction. So God's got to break it. God's got to break it. God's got to intervene. And we see this in this incredible story. Because Jehoshaphat, yeah, he aligns with wickedness. He has a plan to go and get gold so that he can be known as a king that had a great fleet and much gold. And God breaks the plan. He breaks the ships. He destroys the vessels that are leading him to the gold. Because he thinks that is what is going to make him great. So for some weird reason, okay. As I was preparing this message, God gave me this vision of a pot. Like a garden pot. And he said, I want you to paint it gold, and I want you to do this, what would it be? Demonstration before the wall. So here's my pot. I bought this pot, and it was uh, just a normal clay pot in the garden center. I painted it gold. I actually realized I've actually got a really good career in painting pots. Look at that. It's amazing. <laughs> if it all goes wrong for the pastor's role. So here's the pot. I'm coming back, Joe. That's okay. All right. But here's the pot. What is the pot? The pot is the vessel. The pot is the ship. The gold is the destination. Okay, well, what does that look like for, for us? Well, maybe for some people here, the pot is fear. And fear leads you to a destination, the gold, whatever that might be. Maybe for others, just like with Jehoshaphat, it's about reputation. The pot is worried about about what people think. That's the vessel. Worried about what people think. Maybe that's for some people here today. You worry about what people think. That bothers you. And the gold is the destination, is is you thinking, okay, if I do certain things, then they'll like me, then they'll acknowledge me, then I'll have the reputation I'm seeking. Oh, they'll, they'll pat me on the back and say yes and amen. Maybe the pot, the vessel, is that you have suffered rejection in your life. The vessel, the ship. You see, the ship is what is leading to the gold. What needs to be dealt with is that the ship needs to be destroyed. So what is it? If it's rejection, you suffered rejection. The gold, the pot of gold. See what I did there? Pot of gold. Yeah. At the end is that you get accepted. But not, but not. Not by God, not with the love of God, not in the way that God wants you to feel and know acceptance, 
but in relationships that are going to destroy you. You might get a hug. You might get someone's attention. You might get someone even say they love you. But if it isn't God's plan, if it's not God's plan, it's going to destroy you. So rejection, feeling lonely, loneliness, fear of loneliness, worried about being alone the rest of your life can mean that you might join some dating apps you're not meant to join. Tinder, I'm talking about you, okay? Yeah. So you start going on, yeah, delete that app. Amen. Okay. But what I'm saying is, I'm saying is if you, if you get, you get what you paid for. So if you join in and cut corners rather than relying on God and trusting God to lead you in the plan that he has for you, then you can end up in a relationship that's actually going to cause you a lot of pain because you fear being alone. That's the vessel. Fear of being alone leads to the gold where you might get someone saying, I, ex- I accept you. Or, but it's just words for a short period. And then you actually get the true colors of who that person really is. And you're stuck now. Maybe they put a ring on it. Now you're even more stuck. That's not God's plan. This is what happens. This is what the vessel can be. And you can put anything else. The vessel can be, we talk about pornography, adultery, sleeping around. That's the gold. That's what we want to feel, yeah? The feeling. What's the pot? Lust. These are the high places that we spoke about earlier that God might be saying you need to deal with in your life. God wants to break these things. For some of you, he's already broken it, but some of you are trying to refix it. So this is a message of warning. He broke it. Don't fix it. He broke it. Not Satan. Not your buddies. God broke it. Don't fix it. Maybe, maybe, maybe even we can talk about theology. See, I'm, I'm a simple Christian. Yeah, I, I'm someone that believes simply in the cross, the work of the cross, the power of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that if we can just operate in such a simple gospel that we will see lives change. Oh, hang on a minute. That's what we're seeing because it's a simple gospel. But what can happen is we can come, sometimes come in with a very complicated way of thinking certain things. Yeah, that can happen. Or we could pick some very complicated stuff up along the way because we listen to the wrong people. And we make the cross more complicated than it can be. And that's called ego. (laughs) That's the vessel. Knowledge. Knowledge is power. No, no, no. Jesus is power. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Knowledge isn't power. Jesus is power. Make sure you hang out with him. Yeah, he will equip you. He'll give you the, the knowledge and the wisdom and the things you need. Yeah, but if you start thinking that, oh, me knowing all this stuff or me having a a whatever, that's going to wreck your relationship with God. And do you know what God will do? He'll smash it to pieces. He broke it. Don't fix it. So sometimes he can smash certain theologies in our life. Yeah, and then a bit further down the road, we start picking it all back up again, saying, oh, maybe I should re-enter that again. God said, we smashed that. Why are we doing that again? I broke that so that you wouldn't go down a path of destruction. That you wouldn't go down a path that actually would create legalism. You wouldn't go down a path that actually would breed condemnation on those that want to know Jesus rather than freedom. This vessel, this pot, this ship can be anything. And for whoever, whoever this word is for today, you have a ship that is leading to a destination of self-fulfillment, self-indulgence, of of falling into a place of being able to get satisfied with your flesh. Maybe it is your ego. Maybe it is your pride. Maybe it is fear of being alone. That's the vessel. Those are the things that mean that you start building it so that you can get to it. So if you're feeling lonely and you're not willing to be patient and wait for God to provide the right person to come into your life, it doesn't even have to be a spouse. It could be a friend. He might just say, I'm going to give you a brother. I'm going to give you a sister. I'm going to give you someone that's going to come alongside you first. That's not what I want. Yeah, but that's what you need. 
That's what you need. So, a bit of a baptism towel out. I've got a baptism in a bit. I painted this lovely pot. Yeah, this is God. Yeah, risk assessment was not taken. Okay. <laughs> I've got the towels to make sure no one gets hurt, I think. I was trying to work out a way of doing it. This is God. This is the word of God. And this is what God's saying is he broke it. Don't fix it. He smashed it. You know, um, seven or so years ago, in this church, there was stuff going on that I, I for me, and pre, I'm previous to seven years, 20 years I've been in this church nearly, where it was not honoring to God. People were arguing. People were fighting. So say in the name of Jesus, but I never heard Jesus' name mentioned. And we had to make, we had to make a stand. We had to say, we're not going to invite religion anymore into this church. We're not going to allow people and their traditions and their way of doing things to overrule what God wants to do. So we smashed it. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. I feel like one of those wrestlers. Is it always the wrestler? WWE? What's it? Is it Triple, triple H? Or triple H or anyway, Triple H. Okay. But anyway, this is the thing. God broke it. We ain't going to put it back together again. He broke it. Yeah, we've got to make sure that when we make a decision to follow Jesus, when we start walking in a relationship with Jesus and he breaks the religion and he breaks the traditions that we're creating and the ways that we think, the, the boats that we're building to try and get to the destination that's going to cause wickedness in us, when he's broke it, we've got to make sure that we're not getting on the ground. That's like she's brushed up a bit. The problem is God has to do this. He told me he has to do this in your life because if he makes the pieces too big, you're going to think that you're clever enough to put it all back together. He's got to smash it. Oh, sorry. Um, ben, can we just build a new stage on Sunday? Thank on Monday, thank you. Okay. But this is what you, this is what, this is what happens. This is what happens is you guys get back on your knees. Do you know what, actually, Joe, why don't you just pan that camera to here? You can put it on the screen for a moment. Just so that people are trying to look. And this is what we do. God broke it. I'm going to fix it. Oh, man. Oh, this is a disaster. This was the relationship that the Lord had provided. How could this go so wrong? Satan, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. I know he wasn't really nice to me. And I know that he abused me. And, but, you know, he had a good heart somewhere. Why would, you re why would you take him away from me? I'm going to try and put it back together. God broke it. Don't fix it. Don't fix it. You need to hear this message. Someone needs to hear this message. This is for somebody here today. He's broke it. And maybe he's broken, broke a relationship in your life. Maybe he's broke a relationship in your life and you keep trying to go back to it. Because you think that you can maybe fix it. And what God is saying is you're building a ship because you're lonely. And you're worried about that God isn't going to provide what you fear. But he says that he gives us the desires of our heart. Okay. 
Now, if you align yourself with God and you've got a desire not to be alone, do you know what? That desire hasn't come from you. It's actually come from God. God's actually written in his word, it's not good that man should be alone. So he's, his plan is, unless he's specifically given you a calling to be single the rest of your life, is that he wants you in communion. He wants you in a relationship. But you have to have patience that he will do it his way. That he will build it. So stop picking up the pieces of the past, of, of the relationships that were being destroyed. It doesn't have to be a romantic relationship. It doesn't have to be a, 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 a marriage. It doesn't have to be um, a, a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend. It could be like parents. It could be children. Um, it can be siblings. It could be friendships. People that were destroying you. And God said, I, got, I broke that before you would get to your destination. Stop. Stop. Stop trying to pick it all back up again. And he said, stop grieving that which I destroyed. I broke it. Don't fix it. He's broke it. So it's time to let it go. It's time to let it go. God broke it. It wasn't, it wasn't on you. Sometimes we think because something was broken and our name was attached to it, that actually, oh man, I failed. I must have failed on that. No, God had to break it. That abusive marriage that you were in, God broke it. What? No, God hates divorce. He wouldn't do such a thing. Oh, no, 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 no. God loves you way more than the situation of you being abused. He is not going to leave you in an abusive situation and say, that's my character. That isn't the character of our God. Our God is a rescuer. Our God, yeah, he comes in and he pulls us out of the pit and he rescues us. So if you made a decision to, to be married and you found out further down the road because we don't always know who we're marrying, we don't always know the friendships and the relationships that we're, we're joining in with, further down the road, that person became abusive and wasn't going to change. God broke it. God broke it. You need to hear it because you're going around feeling, oh, I broke it. No, God broke it. God broke it. Be set free today. Be set free today. Maybe those friendships that you had, you think, oh, shit, I'm not being a very good evangelist because I, I had to walk away from them. That's not what Jesus would want. Jesus said, I broke those relationships. I broke them. They were going to destroy you. They were going to lead you down paths. Not even just people that don't know Jesus, but people that do know Jesus, so say, that are actually leading you down the garden path, yeah, the wrong path of doctrine, teaching you the wrong stuff. God says, I'm breaking that. I'm breaking that. Don't mourn them. Don't try and be pals with them again. I remove them from your life because they would destroy you. He broke it. This, you need to know this, this, that he had to change some things in your life because you started to align yourself with wickedness. You might not even know that you were aligning yourself with it, but he knew what the destination was and he knew why you were doing it. And he says, I haven't got my pot anymore. It's gone. But he says, that vessel, that's what needs to change. So that's what I've got to destroy. Fear is leading you to bad decisions. Fear needs to be destroyed. I broke it. You feel lonely. I'm breaking that vessel. But you need to re-educate yourself so that you know you're actually not alone. That I am with you. I'm not forsaking you. I'm right here. And I have good plans for my children. Yeah? And he says, the plan's not to harm you. Yeah, so he will be the provider. We just sang Jaira. He's a provider. Yeah, he provides for you. So if you're worried about being lonely, God's already on it. He already is putting the plan in place. But if you keep trying to build a ship to get to somewhere so that you wouldn't feel lonely in your timing and in your way, it will destroy you. So God has to destroy the ship. He has to destroy the vessel. So he broke it. He broke it. You don't need to keep fixing it. He broke it. I'm out of breath. Okay. Now this is the other thing to take hold of in this message. Is in Chronicles, it seems like this is how Jehoshaphat's story ends. But in Chronicles, it tells us to read Kings. So if you've got 1 Kings 22 verse 49, it says this. 
than Uzziah. So this is after the ships have been wrecked. So this is documented in Kings previous in 48 that the ships got wrecked just like they are here in Chronicles. But then it says this. After that, yeah, then Isaiah, the son of Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, let my servants go with your servants in the ships, but Jehoshaphat would not. Jehoshaphat would not. 1 Kings 22, 49. Jehoshaphat would not. So Jehoshaphat, yeah, he, he made an alliance with the king because he was worried about his reputation. He wanted to get gold so that he could look like a king of the past, etc., etc. okay? But when God wrecked the ships and then the king came back to him and said, come on, let's keep going, yeah, he said no. Now, this is what happens when we realize we make mistakes. This is what happens when we allow God to break things that were going to cause our harm, us harm, but accept it. Accept it. Accept that God broke it. Yeah, accept that he's done it. Accept that he destroyed it. Accept that he had to remove it. Yeah, accept that he got rid of that guy that was in your life that was going to cause you to be in an abusive relationship the rest of your life. And you loved him. I loved him. I loved him. But God said, yeah, I know that. But the truth is, he didn't love you back. And he wasn't honoring of to me. And he wasn't the right person for you. So I broke it. You didn't break it. Don't carry that weight anymore. I broke it. Okay? It's done. It's finished. Okay? But if we accept that God has broken that, do you know what will happen really quickly? You might see what God has got planned for you quite quickly down the route. Road. Route. Road. Whatever. Okay. Sound like rude, didn't it? Down the route. Um, <laughs> accept it. Accept that God broke it. And when we get that, when we get that revelation, when the temptation comes again, yeah, this is the more important thing. Did Jeho- Jehosha- Jehoshaphat fail? Yeah, yeah, he made a mistake, but hey, huh, look at you guys too. Yeah, we made mistakes, yeah? So does he make a mistake? Yeah, he made a mistake. Did he repeat the mistake? No. Why is that? Because he's known as a man that did right in the sight of the Lord. You see, we're going to make mistakes. But actually, if we become people that do right in the sight of God, and we're known for that rather than, oh, they did some right, but most of it was wrong, yeah? If he was known as a man that did right in the sight of the Lord, it meant that when God intervened like he did, he was able to acknowledge that really quickly and think, oh, hang on a minute. I think I took my eyes off of God there. I think I've aligned with something I shouldn't have aligned with. So when the temptation comes to say, why don't you join that app again? When you hook up with that person again, why don't you go and seek um, that acceptance because you were rejected? Why don't you go and you say, I don't need it anymore. I just remember that I'm a child of God. I just remember that I'm a king of the most high. I've just remembered that he's my father. And actually, I forgot that for a moment because we can all forget that at times. But actually, no, 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 no. He is enough. He is enough. And, and actually, he, he will. He is the one that holds my reputation in his hands. So he can do what he wants with it. I don't need people's validation, gratification. Thank you, both of those. Okay. I don't need that. Because he validates me. And this is what God wants you to acknowledge today for some of you. I got away with one there. God rescued me. I'm not going back into that relationship, that sin. I'm not hanging out with those people or going into that company. I'm not going to make that mistake again. Because God loved me so much that he was willing to break it so I wouldn't even get there. That's what happened. They never got there. They never got to the gold. So when we read about Jehoshaphat, as his, when he's introduced, and he's introduced as a, a man who did right in the sight of the Lord. How is that possible when we've read about his mistakes? Well, because God does not define us by our mistakes, by our states, but by our status before him. 
I'm thankful for that. He's not defining you by your mistakes. What is your status before him? Do you actually even know him? Is he in your life right now? Where is he in your life right now? Who is he to you? Where is he? In scripture, it says that love, God's love, does not keep account of evil. In other passages, it says God keeps no record. Love keeps no record of wrongs. This is what it says. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding base of a, or a clanging symbol. You can... <laughs> You can be somebody that prophesies. You could be someone that's like singing in tongues. You could be someone that looks spiritual and ticks all the right box. But if you do not have love, it's just noise. It's just noise. It, this is what scripture says. It's just noise. It's not, it doesn't mean anything. If you don't have love, and that love you can't get unless you've got Jesus. Although I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith. So I could remove mountains. But have not love. I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. And though I give my body to be burned. But have not love. It profits me. Nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, which is also keeps no record of wrongs, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. This story is a message of God's incredible love for you. You keep trying to put it all back together. Oh, maybe if I just did it different, maybe if I do it different this time, maybe it was me. God's like, it wasn't you. It had to break because of where it was leading. I had to end it. I had to destroy it. It's not just about relationships. It can be sins in your life. And we kind of think, oh, yeah, but it's, what's the problem with it? God's like, it will consume you and destroy you. So I'm going to break it. I'm breaking the vessel. I'm going to destroy lust in your life. That's going to end. So you don't access the actual things that cause you pain and emptiness. I'm going to destroy the addiction. So you don't start putting yourselves in places that are going to cause consequences that you can't undo. God's love wins. We have a God who has shown us how to love, how to act and how to walk out our journey with Jesus. Without it, our works break. Our efforts are pointless. Our lives meaningless. As Christians, we need to keep, keep allowing God to soften our hearts. Allow God to put in us again his love where we've gotten hardened. And like God, we keep no record of wrongs. We love. We love. Why do we need to let go of the wrongs done to us? Because we do wrong to God. And if you actually want to have access in a relationship with God, and you're not willing to let go of the wrongs done to you, then you have not got access to God. He loves you too much, so he'll break it. He will break it in you. He will break it in you. Maybe he wants to break something in you today. The scripture that says that the heart 
has become a heart of stone, but God wants to turn it into a heart of flesh. Well, maybe God needs to take a sledgehammer to your heart so he can smash the stone around it so that actually he can do the work in it so that you can actually honor him and love the way that he's leading you and guiding you and teaching you how to.